March 6th, 2359. On the frontier between the Cardassian Union and the Federation, an uneasy peace has stood for four years. A peace not forged by mutual understanding or in the aftermath of victory, rather a peace forged in desperation, with neither side truly trusting or believing it. Both sides refuse to back down and remain steadfast in their stubbornness, and both labour under the conviction that victory is within their grasp. And yet, for the last decade, victory has remained ever elusive. Starfleet, averse to open conflict, has dithered away opportunities for fear of being too aggressive. Meanwhile, the Cardassians find themselves in a heavyweight fight in which they are hopelessly overmatched. Only now are they coming to realize the terrible price demanded for victory, a price that shall forever stain the soul of Cardassia. While in the last four years the frontier has returned to a semblance of peace, confrontations and skirmishes continue between Cardassian and Starfleet ships. Even so, colonists from both sides continue to flock to the frontier, hoping to build their new lives in peace. For Cardassian colonists in particular, the frontier appears as a land of opportunity and plenty next to the increasingly desolate core worlds of the Union which have been ravaged by overpopulation and unsustainable strip mining and collectivized industrial agriculture, which was the cumulative result of the rapid Cardassian militarization during the 2350s, all in an effort to secure the desperately needed resources of the frontier. And so, many Cardassian farmers were dragooned into the military as conscripts or as labourers in the shipyards, their land torn up for duranium mining. The remaining farms were reorganised into military-controlled collectives. The implementation of these policies were disastrous, with insufficient harvests during 2353 and 2354. What little food there was, was seized by the military causing some one million Cardassians to die of starvation. A further famine was only averted by the intensification of the Bajoran occupation, leading to some five million Bajorans to die in labour camps, as well as a trade deal with the Ferengi Alliance, in which the state sold countless historic artefacts and treasures from the first Hibitian dynasty in order to pay for food and arms. Five years hence, and Cardassia is beginning to recover. However, Goltar Obrek is willing to jeopardize it all. In his mind, Cardassia can only be truly healed through one final victory. In his address to the Datapa Council, he stated, Our struggle is not one concerned with conquest or expansion. It deals with the being or not being of our very union, of being or not being of Cardassian will and Cardassian constitution. Our enemy knows not hunger, knows not want, and he is weaker for it. His resolve shall break like brittle iron against forged steel. And then they and the galaxy shall recognize the children of Cardassia as a great power and a strong people who demand their respect. So that our sons can once again form a great Cardassian union, which we shall buy for them with our very life blood. On the frontier itself, some agreement between the two had been reached with the Federation recognizing Cardassian territory adjacent to the McAllister Nebula, and conversely the Cardassians recognized Federation holdings parallel and below the Badlands. Within the frontier colony region, 
two sovereign zones had been formed, which were recognised by both parties, the Federation zone running from Dorvan to Jiraya, and the Cardassian from Veloz to Beltani. However, the rest of the frontier remained in dispute, with the systems of Solossos and Ankana remaining as significant bones of contention between the two. The shadow of suspicion and distrust continued to loom in the frontier, with cargo ships disappearing frequently. Both sides blamed each other, as well as the destruction of the Stargazer in 2355. At the same time, the Bajoran resistance began to escalate their attacks on their Cardassian occupiers, which the Cardassians blamed on the Federation. Just as later, in 2357, the Federation blamed the Cardassians for supporting the Telerians in their own border conflict against the Federation. Fearing the Cardassians would use their sovereign zone as a base, Starfleet station ships at Umoth, Renara, Hackton, and controversially, the Cardassian colony of Ankana. Legate Nasat denounced this as a violation of the ceasefire and threatened retaliation if Starfleet did not withdraw within 72 hours. Nakamura refused to back down, and in response, Nasat invaded Salva on March 9th destroying the USS Poseidon before deploying troops to the surface, quickly and violently subduing the outer settlements. When the larger settlement of Rio del Sol repelled the first wave, Nasat did not hesitate to bombard the settlement from orbit, killing some 12,000 civilians. The remainder then fled to the planet's capital of Knossos, where Starfleet personnel had erected an orbital shield to protect against further bombardments. Upon hearing of this, Admiral Nakamura ordered a task force be assembled to retake Salva and for them to seize spaceports on Ankana in the expectation of a mass Cardassian offensive. In reality, Nasat had no intention of launching a mass offensive at this time. Rather, he hoped to lure Starfleet into a protracted regional battle. The task force of five ships consisting of the Ambassador-class USS Zukov two Springfields and two Miranda arrived on March 11th to face a small force of seven ships, three Echors and four Kulinors, easily outgunned by Starfleet. Nakamura was confident that he could drive the Cardassians from the planet. Yet, as they closed in on the Cardassian position, the USS Emery and USS Grant were struck by torpedo fire from the surface as the Cardassians had deployed surface torpedo launchers, courtesy of Ferengi arms dealers, forcing them to retreat behind the planet's moon. Nakamura realized that the only way to drive the Cardassians from Salva would be to uproot their position on the surface. In order to do so, he would require significantly more personnel and so ordered the USS Queensland, a Sydney-class transport, to reinforce with some 2,000 embarked security personnel. In the meantime, Nakamura did what he could to relieve the pressure on the defenders of Knossos, using a away team to harass the besieging Cardassians, taking some 150 prisoners between them and killing 75 troopers. When the Cardassians attempted to drive them from their position, they were rewarded with one Kulinor disabled and two ships heavily damaged. Even so, when the Queensland arrived on March 16th, it took a further three weeks to fully liberate Knossos, during which time Starfleet suffered upwards of 200 casualties, whilst the Cardassians lost 800. Even so, the Cardassians were able to maintain their foothold on Salva. Retreating into open country, protected from orbital strikes by dampening fields and their torpedo batteries, which in turn served as an anchor for ships in orbit. Their position was further bolstered on April 10th with the arrival of an additional regiment, some 3,000 troops. In response, Nakamura called in further reinforcements before beginning his counterattack on April 20th, codename Operation Gladius. Using reconnaissance teams to identify and designate Cardassian torpedo batteries, which were then destroyed by orbital phaser strikes, allowing Starfleet to then freely engage the Cardassian ships. Over eight weeks, Starfleet rolled back Cardassian gains on Salva, destroying 35 torpedo batteries and killing 1,300 Cardassian troops 
and capturing well over 6,000. Meanwhile, in orbit, Starfleet, during 17 engagements, destroyed 11 Cardassian ships and heavily damaged some 22 others. Yet, this was not without a price. Starfleet lost some 900 personnel on the ground and 7 ships in orbit, and 15 others heavily damaged. As a result, now with the Cardassians driven to their last bastion, Nakamura hoped that he could force a Cardassian surrender. While Nasat did not plan to fight on, he had no intention of surrendering, and instead planned a bold escape named Operation Shashir, or Corsair. On July 2nd, he ordered his remaining flotilla and rearguard to launch a massive counterattack, while his 10,000 remaining troops were evacuated, allowing Nasat to remain at large. Meanwhile, Starfleet personnel had occupied the Fascara Starbase on Ankana since the 17th of March. Unfortunately, the supporting squadron was driven from orbit by reinforcements from Bajor and Beltani, leaving some 2,000 personnel trapped, besieged from the ground and orbit. Even so, they had held out for five months. Nakamura, after driving Nasat from Salva, wanted to capitalize on his success and secure their position on Ankana, beginning Operation Forge on July 9th, leading a fleet from Volan to relieve them. Yet they were intercepted en route and forced to retreat after taking heavy damage. It soon became clear to Nakamura that capturing Ankana would require a level of commitment and resources similar to Salva, which he had no desire to repeat. And so on July 22nd, he sent a message to Ankana saying that they were free to surrender. Ignoring what they had saw as cowardice from their commander, they held out until August 6th. Upon capturing the 1,500 or so remaining personnel, Legat Nasat executed 15 of them on the spot, one for every day they had disobeyed orders. While Nakamura might have wished to de-escalate, Nasat was far from finished, and on September 12th commenced Operation Barakat, which translates as Great Marauder, a famous villain of Cardassian folklore. Over the next two months, Nasat launched over 23 brutal attacks against Federation freighters, destroying 37 and colonies, killing an estimated 6,785 civilians. However, Starfleet did not allow these attacks to go without retaliation, and Starfleet seized over 25 Cardassian freighters, as well as actively hunting down the Cardassian ships that had participated in Operation Barakat. They were able to do so as a result of deciphering Cardassian transponder signals, allowing them to identify and isolate individual Cardassian vessels. As a result of this counter-campaign, Operation Barakat petered out by November 25th, after the 21 ships involved were all unsuspectingly tracked down and destroyed, although Legat Nasat himself continued to elude Starfleet. Fortunately for Starfleet, Nasat's luck finally ran out when on December 5th, news emerged that Nasat's greatest ally, Gultar Obrek, the leader of the Cardassian Union for over 40 years, had suffered a fatal stroke, eventually passing away on December 8th. A new ruling triumvirate emerged, within which Nasat was not popular, and he was soon after demoted from the Guard's order. The new triumvirate sought to end the conflict as soon as possible. However, in their current position, realized they were unlikely to receive favorable terms, given their weak position. Therefore, they agreed on one final campaign, which sought not to capture territory, but bring Starfleet to a decisive engagement in which the Cardassians could show strength. The officer chosen to lead this operation was none other than the recently vindicated Legat Jazuk, returned from exile Given her past successes in Operation Mir Lusar, she was considered the ideal choice. And just as in Mir Lusar, the Cardassians had deployed their newest classes, so would they again in this new offensive, 
seeing the first deployment of the Galore-class heavy cruiser. In development since 2350, the Galore was envisaged as a universal heavy cruiser, a concept which nearly all the major powers had experimented with, with other examples such as the Nebula or Vocha class. However, the Galore was the first to be produced en masse. The Galore has a length of 481 meters, a width of 259 meters, and a draft of 76 meters. It is operated by a crew of 600 and able to reach speeds upwards of warp 8. While not as heavily armed as its Echor predecessor, its weaponry is far more advanced, with 16 spiral wave disruptors, a fore and aft heavy disruptor, and a fore and aft torpedo launcher, equipping the newer and more accurate Mark IV torpedo. It is plain to see the influences of both the Echor and Kulinor in this design. Indeed, the Galor was intended to bridge the capability gap between the two, although it would in fact go on to replace both. The Galor boasts speeds on par with the Kulinor, while carrying similar firepower to the Echor, all whilst being larger than both. Carried over from the Echor is its impressive carrying capacity, with five shuttle bays carrying anywhere between six to ten shuttles, and it is further augmented by four additional launch bays on the Kelden variant, one of the myriad modular variants available to this class. Equally, it maintains and refines the sleek and agile silhouette of the Kulinor. Indeed, the Galor owes much of its impressive performance to the Kulinor, which pioneered the warp field geometry used by the Galor. Yet more critical, however, was the abrupt change in tactics and doctrine, trading smaller scale pod tactics for more ambitious linear tactics. Rather than pair different classes together, linear tactics dictated that formations either be composed of a single class or of classes with comparable capabilities. By early 2360, 24 of these lines had been formed, with two full Galor lines under the Guard's order, eight Echor lines composed of five Echors and two Galors, and 14 Kulinor lines with six Kulinors and a Galor. During the lull in early 2360, Jazuk quietly replaced the squadrons on the frontier with these new lines, although she kept the Galors hidden within the Sovereign Zone, keeping her intentions hidden. In total, she had deployed 42 ships to the frontier under Nakamura's very nose, with a Galor line hidden in the Badlands, two Echor lines in the Sovereign Zone, and three Kulinor lines spread across the frontier. Jazuk's plan, codenamed Operation Varakatesh, fate is with us, sought to force a large, decisive, deep space engagement from Starfleet. She would accomplish this by ordering the center Kulinor line to launch a series of raids on Hackton, Soltok, and Volan, before falling back to regroup with the first Echor line between Volan and Beltani. When Starfleet called for reinforcements, she expected a squadron from both the Sovereign Zone and from Federation Space. Both of these would then be delayed by the two other Kulinor lines. After defeating the first Starfleet squadron, she would then turn to engage the force inbound from the border, with the help of the second Echor line between Beltani and Ankana, then swinging back round to engage the task force from the Sovereign Zone, in close proximity to Volan. There they would be joined by the reserve Galor line. Operation Varek Tesh began on May 4th, 2360. It seemed to proceed according to plan, with the raids killing 155 civilians. This succeeded in eliciting a Starfleet response, with six ships giving pursuit, three Mirandas, two Excelsiors, and a Cheyenne. Starfleet was initially confident, knocking three of the Kulinors out of warp, but was surprised to see their comrades also drop out of warp to support them. Nevertheless, they engaged, but were surprised by the level of coordination and support utilized by the Cardassians, only destroying one Kulinor and damaging two others. And once the first Echor line arrived, together with three Galors, Starfleet had lost the advantage. The captain of the Excelsior class USS Constantine soon discovered to his misfortune that these new ships 
were more than a match for him, and he was quickly overwhelmed and destroyed, as well as one of the Mirandas. Yet, to Jazuk's surprise, Starfleet's reinforcements arrived from the Sovereign Zone soon after, including the Ambassador class USS Zukov and Yamaguchi, as well as the USS Renegade, USS Kyushu, the Springfield class, USS Mira, USS Maitland, and USS Stannis, which had broken through the Kulinor patrol and used their superior speed to rescue the beleaguered squadron. This prompted Jazu to change her plans, and she ordered her fleet to make a fighting retreat towards Volan to rendezvous with the guard's Galore line. However, this was no easy task, as the Starfleet vessels were faster than most of her ships, making repeated attempts to cut her off. Only by placing the Galors at the head of the formation was she able to keep moving, eventually making her rendezvous with the Galor line, retaking the advantage. Nakamura realized that he was outnumbered and knew if he turned tail, he would only be run down. So he engaged the Cardassian line, attacking in two columns, diverting all power to his forward shields. This bold move paid off, with two Echors destroyed, although the Cheyenne was destroyed and the Stannis sustained heavy damage. Nonetheless, Nakamura fought on, ordering a figure of eight maneuver, circling around the fringes of the line, isolating the Cardassians and firing from all sides, destroying two Kulinors. Jazuk concentrated fire and broke out of the encirclement, destroying the Stannis before attacking the outside of the second circle, heavily damaging the Kyushu and destroying a Miranda. Nakamura responded, quickly moving the circle into line, crossing Jazuk's T, firing a full volley at her flagship, the Kapesh, destroying it utterly. Even so, the Cardassians pressed the line, destroying the Maitland and the heavily damaging the Yamaguchi. Both of them then formed into line to try and cut the other off and cross their T again. In this exchange, both the Cardassians and Starfleet sustained heavy losses, with the Cardassians now leaderless and Starfleet detecting more Cardassian ships inbound. Both sides withdrew by almost mutual consent. The Battle of Sector 43 Theta ended in a stalemate, with each side losing six ships. Nonetheless, it achieved Jazuk's goal, although she did not leave to see it, proving to Starfleet beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Cardassians could now fight them as equals. Indeed, when Nakamura made his after-action report, he stated that if Starfleet was to avoid total defeat, they would either have to commit to a full-scale war or negotiate a peace while they were still on equal terms. A ceasefire was declared on June 1st, 2360, and while occasional skirmishes did break out, it would hold until 2363, when the formalized armistice was signed, bringing an end to 16 long years of bitter war. During these 16 years, the Cardassians lost over 260,000 personnel and 1.2 million civilians. Their economy and society had been pushed to the breaking point. Meanwhile, the Federation saw 22,414 civilians murdered and over 15,922 Starfleet personnel killed in the line of duty. Small numbers compared to the Cardassians and smaller still in the minds of most Federation citizens for whom the war had been something far away and beyond their concern. They regarded its ending as they had its inception with indifference. But for those who had lived and fought in the war, this armistice left a bitter taste in the mouths of many. Clashing ambitions and broken promises laid the seeds for future conflicts, and in less than 10 years, the armistice quickly crumbled, turning this fertile, vibrant frontier once again into a blasted, barren battle space.